Oh, no. Is that better? Louder? Good. Okay, good. Yeah, all right. Well, I can certainly, I don't want to overpower you, but let's, anyway, let's get to the formal discussion. Okay. Well, thank you so much for making the time to uh, visit with us uh, today, Lloyd. So we have uh, Lloyd uh, Skibben, that is correct, uh, University of Calgary professor, and I believe in East Asian Studies. Correct. 100%. I'm glad I did my research. He's come here to talk to us a little bit and give us some uh, background to the wonderful non premium exhibit on Chinatown that we have here. Uh, specifically, he's going to try to give us a little bit more background, information on the experiences of Western Chinese Canadians, um, why they came here, the experiences that they have, maybe even a little bit about the experiences they still experience today, um, and just kind of highlight that type of information. I would like you to all know, especially for those that are interpreters, volunteers, uh, that we are currently also recording the session for private use. Um, it will be accessible on the drives and will be forwarded to Sarah. So if you do have any questions about what is uh, discussed here or want some specifics as well that you didn't quite recall, we will have that resource available. Um, more than anything, I do appreciate you all coming here, taking advantage of this, um, and for making this uh, event such a success. Uh, with that said, I'll leave it over to our speaker to uh, do what he does best. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I do want to add to Oleg's introduction that I am retired. Uh, oh, so, gee, it's going to be eight years now. Though I have tried to uh, keep up in terms of knowledge of the field, something that uh, we'll kind of talk a little bit about at the end of the presentation because we'll be talking about the city of Calgary and what they're doing in terms of promoting Calgary Chinatown, something that I've been involved in since 2016 and still going on today. Uh, though today our topics as they're on the board for you are early Chinese Canadian history and the history of the Chinese in Calgary. Uh, just a note, I'd like to say that um, I am a little bit rusty in terms of lecturing, so if you'll bear with me, I will try to keep up the volume, and if you're not hearing, do please raise your hand and I will uh, try to make it louder. Uh, as for questions that you might have, could I ask you to wait till the end of the presentation, about 45 minutes? Um, my memory is not as good as when I was actually a professor, and so I can, and he can be detracted easily. It's, it happens at my age. Um, apart from that, I would like to say that in the spirit, the goal of diversity uh, that I'm presenting this today, I'd also like to acknowledge that we share a history on this land with Indigenous people. So the presentation of different groups within our society that may have been overlooked and maybe even mistreated in the past, I think it's something important and something I'd like to discuss today. So we'll start with the, the Chinese and their first coming to Canada. The, um, they left China in around the mid-1800s, 1880s, when they were starting to come here, 20 years earlier in the United States, and they came mostly from a small area close to Hong Kong. Uh, the, the slide there, you'll be able to see, this is China, this is the small gray area on the bottom there, that's uh, Guangdong, which is the larger picture here, and then the four counties for which the, probably 90% of the early Chinese coming to Canada came from, was this small area here. And if you look, um, Hong Kong today would be right about at that point. Now, this is the, the fact that these, the early Chinese came from this part of, the, of China. Uh, it speaks to the fact, or accounts for the fact, that the early spoken languages within uh, Canada from among the Chinese were things like Toishanese, but also Cantonese. And so today, among Chinese who do speak uh, a Chinese language within Canada, it's, most, it's an even balance between the early uh, arrivals and their descendants who speak Cantonese and the people coming from Hong Kong, but also the mainlanders who come from other parts of China who speak Mandarin. So we've got about an equal, equal balance, but Mandarin is gaining traction and will eventually be the dominant language that's spoken among uh, Chinese who speak Chinese in Canada. <clears throat> there were two factors, two forces that saw the Chinese leave 
China and come to other parts of the world or go to other parts of the world. There was famine, there were natural disasters taking place uh, in China at this time. There was uh, floods, famines, or, or droughts, and so on. So it was hard to make a living. Also, there were wars going on. The Taiping Rebellion was taking place in southern China, 15 years. The Opium Wars, which you might be familiar with, the efforts by Western countries to sell opium in China uh, to balance the trade, to balance the purchase of tea that was being made, the money that they were losing, the silver that they were losing, and the Chinese resisting and then having to fight a war, which they lost miserably because they didn't have the technology, the, the armaments. Those kind of things were going on. And the other force that was taking place throughout the world was the a need for a cheap form of labor. So with the abolishment of uh, slavery, among, starting with Britain in 1833, the end of the Civil War in the United States in 1865, there wasn't that access to a labor force that would be very cheap. So Western countries that were colonializing other parts of the world that needed a cheap source of labor were harvesting people or garnering people from India and from China. And so there was a need to cheap, for cheap labor to build infrastructure in places like... And if you look around the world today, you'll see uh, Chinese in South America. Uh, I remember going to Cuba and going into Chinatown there and reading about how the, they had been moved into Cuba and been taken part of the revolution that Castro started. So they were, in a sense, involved in Cuba as well, in Western Europe, South Pacific, Southeast Asia. The Chinese were going all over the world to work in these places, work for infrastructure, harvesting silver in Southeast Asia, and so on. Coming to Canada, the Canada Canadian need was to build a railway. Now, I imagine most of you know why we were building a railway. It was obvious for two reasons. One is, British Columbia was told, was promised a railway, and on that promise they agreed to join Confederation with Canada. The other thing was the expansion of the United States, both into Mexico and in, certainly into Canada. And so there was a need to build, put settlers along the coast, close to the border, and so the need for a railway. The problem was is that the railway, in order to be built, it was believed that Chinese workers were necessary. There was some background to it. The fellow who built the railway, the <laughs> western section in British Columbia, was a fellow named Ander, Andrew Onderdock. And he had built parts of the railway in the United States and used Chinese labor to do that. Now, McDonald, who was the prime minister at the time, didn't want to bring in Chinese workers. In fact, we'll, we'll see that he actually ran a campaign, an election, to try to get votes by currying favor with the populace in terms of, of, of being prejudiced against Asian labor. They were seen as a threat to, to workers in Canada because of the low wages. We'll, we'll review that in a sec. But anyway, so Anderdonk was able to get all of the contracts to build the western section of the railway. He did actually try to use a, a, for, a workforce of white workers. Didn't work out. So he went to McDonald and said, look, if you want the railway, we're gonna get, we have to get Chinese workers. He brought in the first section, or the first group of Chinese workers from the United States that had helped him build there, but that wasn't sufficient. That was only a quarter of the workforce that he needed. The rest had to come from China. And so they started to import labor coming from Hong Kong where there was an international port and people could travel all over the world on, on vessels and they brought them into Canada to work. So over the course of the four years of the building of the railway, there were about 14, 16, or uh, let's see, three quarters would be about 12,000 12, workers came from China to work on the railway. There had been other groups of Chinese that had come to work in the gold fields and in the coal mines and on the roadways prior to that, but the big influx came to build the railway. So we see a picture here. This is a group of Chinese workers working on a rail bed <coughs> for the Canadian Pacific. You can see where, of course, the typical Chinese hats that they would wear in the south to avoid the sun, but there were always a couple of uh, white foremen on, 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 the, on the workplace to there to supervise. When the Chinese did come, even though they were necessary, they were required, and that was acknowledged, 
They did meet with racism. There was a anti-Asian and anti-Orientalism. Anti -orientalism. It became a rallying principle. And I mentioned McDonald, but it wasn't just him. It was local politicians who would go out to workers and say, look at these Asian workers. They're working for half the price you are. We don't want them in Canada. And of course, if you vote for me, then I will make that happen. At the same time, businessmen wanted white workers who were going to patronize their businesses rather than the Asian workers who would patronize Asian businesses. So they were also promoting this anti-Orientalism within Canada. And Macdonald in 1882 ran for the, on a slogan of Canada for Canadians. Keep in mind or do know what a Canadian was at that time was a British subject resident in Canada. The ability to naturalize, to become a citizen, didn't take place until 1947. And the Chinese, as Peter Lee in his book, The Chinese in Canada, he pointed out in BC at this point, at this time, the Chinese were considered to be unassimilable. You can see that in the cartoon, the illustration that's on the board now. The contrast between the white working man on the top, coming home to his single family home, um, with two children, his wife waiting for him, and then the Chinese on the bottom, who said to infest, if you look at the, the text there clearly, a single building infested by 2,000 Chinese smoking opium. And on the bottom it says, the unanswerable argument I interpret that as saying is that why are we importing labor, allowing people from Asia to come into the country? And of course there's no answer for that because it's so obvious. <coughs> The working conditions and wages, again, were reflective of the fact that they were looked down upon, the Chinese workers. They were paid about half that of what the white workers were paid. Um, the wages varied from 25 cents a, a day to $1.25 a day. And the work was often more dangerous. The estimate is that on the railway, four Chinese died for every mile of construction. An example of the labor, and the contribution will kind of take a shift here because you'll see, even though they were biased, there was prejudice against Chinese workers, they were actually very large contributors to the growth and development of the country. And here we see a Chinese worker in the canning industry, the salmon cannery. Now this is interesting because the worker, beside the worker, is a machine. That machine is called an iron chink. Now, chinko, you probably know, is a very derogatory term for Chinese. It, reflects, it's, it's, it indicates the eye shape. In other words, Orientals, Asian people, sometimes have narrower eyes. It was referred to as chinky or chink, like a chink in a board or whatever. And so these people were referred to as chinks. And again, a very derogatory term to see, looked down upon very much. But in terms of the fact that it was replacing Chinese workers, Chinese workers occupied three quarters of the workforce in the cannery business. And so they had there, it's, uh, the uh, machine was called an iron, made of iron chink. If you go to Prince Rupert, they actually have a cannery that's on display there, you can tour. I think it's part of the uh, national um, monuments within the country. And you can see one of these actually in place. Now, even though they were bought, there was prejudice against them, the Chinese, if you can see from um, people who were willing to uh, describe and discuss what the Chinese contributed to the country, you can see that they were actually very important in terms of building up the structure, building up the country. So Big B, who was the uh, Chief Justice in British Columbia, and when he was interviewed at the Royal Commission on the Chinese in Canada, there were two of them. BC kept pressuring the central government, the federal government, to do something about Asian immigration. Um, and so the federal government tried to placate them and of course offered these commissions to try and deal with the situation. But you can see in terms of the building of the railway, the coal mines, the salmon cannery, the people poor, employed in the gold mines, and the vegetables grown in British Columbia, the Chinese workers were actually very large contributors to the province. Still, they faced prejudice and bias. We see in terms of <laughs> occupations, uh, they were excluded from the provincial voters list, and then they, because of that, excluded from the federal, the national voters list. And once you were due, once that happened, because of qualification to become a lawyer, pharmacist, 
to work in teaching in different areas, that was something that you had to have. You had to be able to register on the voters list. And the Chinese, unable to because of legislation in BC, were then barred from occupying or from working in these industries. Um, in fact, as you can see in that 50 year period, 1872 to 1922, BC enacted more than 100 pieces of legislation discriminating against Chinese and other Asians. An interesting piece of legislation was the forbidding of white women to work in Chinese restaurants. Now the Chinese faced a problem. It was a, basically a male society. Uh, the, foot, the, hood, the, fit, the, the head tax, the, uh, the expense of coming over the country to the country to Canada to work meant precluded having many <coughs> women come into the country from China. And so uh, to work in the restaurants, and I guess there's a the stereotype here is that women who are waiting on, there just wasn't the workforce to provide for to work in the, in, in the Chinese restaurants. So when there weren't males available, they mm -hmm. hired white women. And that, the law came into effect was, 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 uh, <clears throat> was put in place in four, six provinces across the country. In BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Quebec, and Nova Scotia. And of course, that's by far the biggest part of the population. So what we see in the next slide is actually a group of women in Vancouver who had lost their jobs because they were no longer allowed to work in Chinese restaurants and who were then protesting or preparing to march to City Hall to protest the fact that they couldn't work within the Chinese restaurants. An interesting aspect. Well, the prejudice that the Chinese faced, the bias that they faced, didn't attract them from wanting to come to Canada. And BC still was <coughs> very much against their coming to Canada, especially after the building of the railway in 1885. And so they pressured the federal government to put in place the head tax. They started at $50 in 1885. That still didn't slow down the immigration. And so five years later, they doubled it. Again, didn't work to the effect that they wanted. And so three years later, they put, well, I guess, what do you say? $500, five times, what, 100. So over that period that the head tax was collected, there was a $23 million income on the part of Canada. <clears throat> that still didn't discourage the Chinese from coming, and so eventually, under the, again, the pressure coming from British Columbia, in 1923, the federal government enacted the Chinese Immigration Act. It was also called the Chinese Exclusion Act. You couldn't come to Canada if you were Chinese unless you were a diplomat, a business person, or a student. And so you see, over that period of the law being in place, that act, 23 to 47, there were only 44 Chinese that were able to come into Canada. And what happened then, of course, was that the population of Chinese Canadians started to go down, especially with not having there were very few women in, in, in the country. And Chinese people, Chinese males, sometimes would marry with indigenous women, but that was probably the only uh, member of the opposite sex of that grouping that they could find prospective spouses. So what happened, the men who were unable to marry or whose wives were unable to come to Canada to join them, they became what was called a bachelor society within Canada. And you can see another, in another illustration, this time in the Toronto Star, this perception already in 1907 was present within Canada, where on one side you have the oriental immigration into Canada being blocked, where white immigration is welcomed into the country. And if you can, not sure that's not, that text on the bottom, it says, the same act which excludes Orientals should open wide the portal of British Columbia to white, white, work, white immigration. So the country as itself was looking at, in terms of keeping out Asians from Canada. So we see in terms of how the Chinese within Canada adapted to this kind of prejudice that they faced, that even so, with that, they were able to, if wanted to, come to Canada to, to live, to work. Mm -hmm. So in 1901, we see a 17,000. 1911, 10 years <coughs> later, that's gone up. And then in 21, there's 40,000. 
And then we see 1923, the act comes into place and we see the growth slow down. And then after 1931, under the act, that the numbers within Canada actually go down as the birth rate is, declines considerably. <clears throat> Still with that, you find in Eastern Canada, a professional class or professional grouping start to Chinese able to enter professions, architects and so on. The reason for that, and we'll take a look at this, this is the 1920s and 1930s. So the Chinese are going into the United States 1960 to build a railway. So we get to 1920, that's already 60 years. That's two generations. So the Chinese are gradually moving across the United States and into along the eastern seaboard up into Canada. So the Chinese that are going into eastern Canada in the 1920s and 30s, Many of them have um, a past, or some ex a, a, quite a lot of experience within North America. They've developed the resources, the intelligence, the ability to work within society. And the second factor within their favor is that they joined Christian groups, church groups. And within those groups, because the Christians support them and promote their benefits, their development within society, they're able to enter into, prof into professions. And then in 1947, for two major reasons, Canada decides that they're going to repeal the Chinese Immigration Act. The two reasons are, is one, that the Chinese within Canada devoted much of their resources to the war, Canadian war efforts in both the First and the Second World Wars. There was a debate among Chinese within Canada at the time. They said, we have no rights. We're prejudiced against. Why should we help Canadians fight wars in Europe that's really, to our extent, really not part of our concern? We're concerned about Japanese invasion in, in China, but what's happening in Europe isn't that important to us. But they decided that they would allow themselves to volunteer in the war and to be conscripted. And as well, they, they bought millions of dollars worth of war bonds. And as well, they had activities to <coughs> solicit funds within their communities. Women would get together and have pie sales and sewing bees and so on to collect money to support forces in, in, in the war effort. And the second reason is that Canadians progressed. We saw what happened in Germany and the Nazis' treatment of the Jewish people and we said racism is not something that we will accept given what has the Nazis have done to the Jewish people. And so there was a very strong support for repealing the law and allowing Chinese people to become naturalized citizens within Canada. Along with the adaption of the Chinese in terms of population growth, they also built Chinatowns. Now there's a debate around Chinatowns as to why they exist within Canada. There's two sides to that debate. The well, first side says that the Chinese were insular, that they wanted to have a grouping where they could rely on one another and promote their own culture. And there's some credibility to that, and of course there's some reason that those also, I, I think there is merit in that argument. That was part of the reason. There are benefits within Chinese culture, and I, we'll talk about those a little bit. Obviously the mutual support. To give you an example, the Cultural Center downtown, one of the founders, Victor Ma, talked about the Ma family, the Ma clan. And they had a home, a, a building just on the east side of the Center Street Bridge. This is the east side on the south side, southeast side. And the Ma family, and the Ma clan at that time was maybe 33 individuals. And not all of them were working. So those who worked would bring home rice and whatever that they could afford to buy and they would share it among the other clan members. That was very common, this, this concept of mutual support. So lacking the support that from the mainstream community, the mainstream society, the Chinese relied on themselves. But this was part of what it was to be a, part of, a member of Chinese culture. The other side of the debate was that Chinese were forced into these types of enclaves, forced to construct them. Uh, there were actually laws put in place. We tried to do it in Calgary, in fact. Lethbridge was successful. <coughs> they said to the Chinese, if you're going to be in Lethbridge, you have to live in a certain place. You can't live anywhere else. So they designated where the Chinese were going to live. Well, there was also other factors that were in place. I mean, even when there were no designations, 
The Chinese, in order to be able to survive, they had to be able to, uh, for example, are gather, uh, gain resources from their own people, this mutual support thing. Uh, oftentimes they were the subject of physical attacks, and so they took up the habit of traveling in groups, things of that nature. And so, to a certain degree, Chinatowns were a construction of Western or, I suppose, mainstream forces that were prejudiced against the Chinese. And just to see an example of that, I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with Richmond, B.C., um, just south of Vancouver, where the airport is. That's the population of that community, that city, is 50% Chinese. They are ethnic Chinese. Now, it really strikes me, it's hard for me to identify any area within Richmond that's a Chinatown, as I understand Chinatown, like in downtown Calgary. I see a lot of Chinese businesses and restaurants. They seem to be very modern. Um, and also they blend very much into the residential communities, but I can't pick out a specific area and say that's Chinatown. So if the Chinese, and this is a later development, Richmond, more of a Hong Kong money coming into Canada, if, uh, in that kind of sense, if the Chinese aren't, in a sense, forced to live in a certain area because of restrictions on them, maybe they just blend into the mainstream community, preserving much of their <coughs> culture as they see fit rather than to develop this sort of enclave that becomes a Chinatown. But anyway, Chinatowns were developed across Canada, were built across Canada. We have now probably eight to ten of them within Canada. Um, the first one was in, in Victoria. So in Victoria in 1880, even before the building of the railway, there were <clears throat> 3, or 2,000 Chinese who, have, uh, who were a third of Victoria's population. And you can see picture here. It was actually very well, well developed. What Victoria was was called an entreport. Mm -hmm. This is where the Chinese who were coming from China or from inland to, or coming to, China, to Canada to work and were on their way to interior BC, or Chinese who were finished for the season or going back to uh, a more mm -hmm. temperate climate to, to wait out until the spring where work started again, or were going back to China. This is where they would stop, and they would then pick up supplies, or supplies would be sent from here into the hinterland, into the inter interior, and they would then, in a sense, <clears throat> be transported through this area. So for that reason, there were many business people, Chinese business people, who were working here, and who built establishments, like you see on the, on the slide there. Now it's interesting, and just as an aside here, I'm not sure how many have ever heard the term hotbed. So a hotbed is this, you could describe it as a, it occurred in Chinatown. Because they wanted to save money, the occupation of the facilities was very dense. And so what they did with a bad place was that they separated into three eight-hour shifts. So you had a common space where you could play fantan or smoke your opium or whatever, and there were like, I think, the opium was legal then, there was something like, 10 or 12 opium shops with, or, or, or manufacturing facilities within Victoria. You could use that common space, but the bed was yours for eight hours. And so when someone finished their eight hour shift, it was still warm for you to go into the shift because you were then on the next shift, so it was still hot for you to go, to, to, to go into bed. Chinatowns today have some interesting functions. The first is the symbol of Chinese culture. And that's very, I think, general, but it does speak to specific values. So the value of senior care within Chinatown. I'm not sure if many of you know Wing <coughs> Chi. They, they started with a single facility on, uh, with about 300 residents on Center Street and 10th, and now they're, I think, building their fourth with a kindergarten and other facilities as well. So they've done very well in terms of promoting Chinese Canadian elder care within Canada, within Calgary. There are other facilities, there are retirement <coughs> homes within uh, Chinatown that, <clears throat> again, promote Chinese the senior care. In fact, some people joke that Chinatown is just a big senior center because they can operate using their language that they speak, their Cantonese and so on. They can buy the goods they want and there's activities that they can do. There's a senior center there. And the senior center even has outreach, where they go out into areas like, uh, <clears throat> well, 
let's see, that area, Edgemont, where there's a lot of Chinese resident as well. But if we talk about senior care, there's another value too that's important. And I'll sort of preface that with a, uh, some knowledge that I gained when I was researching my book on Chinese Canadians. The demographic within Alberta at that time, and this is something like six years ago, um, that, has, that has the longest lifespan is Chinese Canadians. So it's the Chinese without Alberta are identified as those people having the longest lifespan. Now, I've already <coughs> told you enough information for you to guess which part of Canada, which city, has the longest lifespan. No? So which, kind, which city has a very large Chinese population? Richmond, right. Richmond with 50% of the population of Chinese has the longest lifespan in Canada. And we attribute that to Chinese medicine. The fact that it's not so much uh, reactive to, I'm sick, I better get on my cell phone and call a doctor and get in that MRI, but rather the kind of intake I have in terms of consumption of foods, my lifestyle, all of those are in sense dictated by a culture that says you have to keep healthy. You're old, you have to exercise, things of that nature. So there's those kind of values that you find, the promotion of education, the uh, relationships where you help one another, things of that nature. Uh, they also hold cultural events downtown, and there's something coming up uh, next weekend and the weekend after, which is the Lunar New Year. And the cultural center has some activities going on. Usually those are attended by tens of thousands of people. Some interesting demonstrations, different martial arts, the dances. Uh, sometimes they have a uh, <clears throat> selling where they sell out of booths and things of that nature, like a marketplace, things of that nature. Ethnic services, language schools. Language schools are an interesting uh, cultural aspect as well. We, we often think of it as terms of heritage retention, but for the Chinese, it was the fact that it was very difficult for them to find work in the main street, especially after the railway was built. So where did they find work? They found work within Chinatown. To be able to work within Chinatown, you needed to be able to speak the, culture, speak the language and understand the culture. And so Chinese school was a way to do that. If you go to places like Victoria, they were actually denied <coughs> education. They weren't allowed to go to the schools. They were said that they would bring back down the educate or the standards of the slow down the other students. So they could, they built their own schools and put them in place. And then also Chinatown is a gateway. We can understand it as a gateway for Chinese immigrants coming into the country who need a place to establish themselves, gain resources before they go into the mainstream. But it's also a gateway for uh, non-Chinese to understand some of the benefits of Chinese culture. But now as China becomes a more economic, economically advanced country, second biggest economy in the world, some say the first, depending how you measure it, then if you want to access China, oftentimes Chinese people within Canada are what they call a transnationalist. They're working in two countries. There used to be a term called astronauts for the people who lived, the Chinese who lived in, in Vancouver because they were spent so much time in the air flying back and forth between Hong Kong and Vancouver as they operated their businesses in Hong Kong, but they kept their families in Vancouver. So if you want to access that, then this is a gateway for someone to do that. I'd like to turn now to the history of Chinese in Canada, and I'll just mention the Chinese Chinatown Historical Context paper that was commissioned by the city government published in 2019. It's a good work, it's available on the internet. So after the railway was completed in 1885, Chinese Canadians needed a place, uh, needed work. They moved along the railway line, moving east into Alberta, then other parts of the, of the country. And our first known presence of Chinese within Calgary, 1886, it wasn't easy. They had to pay a license fee. It was five dollars to be able to reside here, and they weren't met very well. In 1892, uh, Chinatown was attacked. A Chinese had come from um, Vancouver and brought smallpox 
with him. It had spread within the community, and three to four, four to five people had died. <coughs> the, a mob horde, when that became known, and attacked Chinatown and ransacked it. And the Chinese within the Chinatown then had to go to the Northwest Mounted Police barracks in Fort Calgary to seek refuge. And after three weeks, they were able to go back to Chinatown. Mm -hmm. um, after the first two Chinatowns were unsuccessful in establishing themselves permanently, the Chinese had accumulated enough resources, funds, to be able to buy property and plan to build on Center Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue Southeast. But at the time, again, reflecting the prejudice within the country, within the community, a group led by James Short opposed the building and demanded the city designate that the China, Chinatown be situated where the Shaw Millennium Skateboard Park is today. Uh, to the city's credit, they said, okay, we'll put together a committee, half Chinese, half white, and they will make the decision for us. And they decided in favor of allowing the Chinese to build. And so today, we have the Canton block, which you can see in this earlier photo, looking towards the river on Center Street. On the right-hand side, that's the Canton block. And if we look at a more modern-day photo, you can see it looking north or looking south from the river toward the Canton block. This is the far corner. The community did evolve. Different organizations, as the Chinese were in forced and able to organize themselves into hometown, home place associations, mutual aid societies, and kinship associations, oftentimes with a lot of flexibility in terms of membership. So if you take the Lee Association on 2nd Avenue Southwest, they were very flexible in admitting anybody who had a close similar name to the family Lee. Sometimes there were four surnames that would form a, a kinship association, four families just because they needed to group together to support themselves. Uh, some political parties were formed, the Holman, the Freemasons, and also the Chinese National League, which were the um, connected to the party that fought with the communists in the Civil War, Chiang Kai-shek, and lost in 1945 and then retreated to Taiwan. They built a building, and I'll show you in a minute. They were a politi major political force, the Communist Party, still just in its earlier formation, not having any kind of representation within Calgary. The first public school was formed, 1920. And here's some of the early structures in, in Chinatown. You might recognize the facade of the United Church on 2nd Avenue. That's this one here. That's still in place, but behind it now is a senior center, a senior home called the Clover Living. And next to it was the Chinese mission, Thomas Underwood, who became mayor of Calgary, built that for the Chinese. On one hand, promoting Christianity among them, but also giving them a location to learn English, some residences, but also locations for recreation. There was a, a gymnasium within the mission that they could play basketball. There was a hockey team formed out of this, and so on. Um, and then on the far side there, that's the Chinese public school. <clears throat> This is an early photo, 1954, of the Chinese National Building. And you probably will recognize that if you go by today. On the top there, you'll see a flag from Taiwan. After the Chinese Immigration Act, 1923, the community became more isolated, inward looking, as it did across the country. Interestingly, because of the fact that Chinatowns across the country were built in places that tend to have cheaper property values and didn't see the types of developments that you saw in other parts of cities, the Chinatowns across the world country became targets for urban renewal in the in 1960s. The federal government was giving out funding very freely to municipalities to rebuild, to boost their tax base, and Chinatowns were targets across the country to do that. And in Calgary, there was no exception. And some of the things they proposed, for example, there was a discussion of building a four-lane freeway along the Bow River in order to bring traffic into downtown Calgary. 
And of course, that would have seen the demolishment of Chinatown. So to their credit, the Chinese within themselves, a group of Chinese or Canadian-born Chinese young professionals formed what's called the Xianluk Society. The Xianluk means the greatest happiness comes from giving. Very idealistic in their thinking. And they lobbied uh, across the nation, across the continent, in fact, because it was happening in the in United States as well. And they said, we need to preserve Chinatowns. And to our credit, to, to, to Calvary's credit, we listened. And we didn't allow that penetrator to be built. So if you're familiar with Toronto and you see the Gardner Expressway between downtown Toronto and the lake, you can see how what an eyesore that is and how much it detracts from appreciation of the scenery, the lake itself. Just to think, if we didn't have a river walk today, we had a four-lane freeway along the Bow River, what it would be like. And the fact that we don't is to the credit of the Chinese who were opposed it at the time. The Cultural Center, 1992, was built. And they had an important landmark modeled after the uh, Temple of Worship in Beijing. <clears throat> and Chinatown became very cosmopolitan in terms of different groupings coming from China, uh, from Guangdong, from Hong Kong, Greater Mainland China, uh, simulated Chinese Canadians in Taiwan. Now, just to close, to talk about what's happening today, um, myself, I think I saw Dale was around, is it over here? No. Her and I have been part and also part of the uh, Dale Kuala. Okay, sorry about that. So we've been part of a group called the um, Chinatown Advisory Group. We've been working with the city since 2018. <coughs> and what we've been doing, because the city has been willing to promote culture and to promote diversity with divide and variety within our, our, our city, they have put in $700,000 and they're talking about more money going into the promotion of Chinatown. On, in with, the, with the Tomorrow's Chinatown project, they've come out with three major initiatives. The first one is a cultural plan to promote culture and preserve it within Chinatown. To just step back for a sec, this is a prototype that they're hoping to use across the different communities in Calgary. And so if you go into Bridgetown and you say, there's a certain culture in Bridgetown, and it is, it's an interesting area nowadays. Do we want to preserve that and promote it? They're looking at what they're doing in Chinatown today with its uniqueness and see if they can apply that to other communities in the, in the city. But within Chinatown, they're looking at, three major, at five major themes. So they're looking at, for example, in terms of people, looking at multi-generational housing. Can we put grandma and grandpa together with mom and dad and the kids in a place that's got a bigger area, space area, <clears throat> floor area that they, they have enough space to live in? Can we put in parks that they can recreate and so on? Um, the culture, of course, they're looking at forming an arts cooperative where art within Chinatown is devoted. There's an art gallery down there and things of that nature. Some of the murals that go onto the walls. Um, commerce, of course, can they support new businesses within Chinatown? Some of the restaurants and so on, or some of the, some of the Joe Bar, the, <clears throat> the bars that, that's gone in recently. Housing, we talked about, and some of the historical sites that should be preserved. There's also an area redevelopment plan, and that's material infrastructure. That is how, how tall your buildings are, what your streets are formed of, even your utilities. But what's interesting about the area redevelopment plan that's been put in place and voted accepted about by City Hall passed is that it brings in the cultural dimension. So they're saying, okay, we want to avoid wind impact against the seniors who are a big part of the population there. We don't want tall buildings that are going to, promote, going to make them cold when they walk on the street. We're going to put in Chinese facades on, on, on the buildings. The signage is going to be allowed so that typical Chinese signage that sticks out from the building is going to be allowed. We're going to do things to keep down, for example, traffic quieting. So we're not going to allow, say, so much of the uh, major traffic through. Even Center Street is considered that there's going to be some way to try and tone down the heavy traffic on Center Street, things of that nature, into the infrastructure, into the material building of the city, or development of the, of the community. But at the same time, there's going to be, they're going to look for development. They're hoping to put in affordable housing down there, things of that that they'll promote, <coughs> giving greater density to people who are willing to put in affordable housing. 
<clears throat> and then finally, the renaming of James Short Park. James Short, of course, you know from the presentation, was prejudiced against the, the Chinese. And so the fact that there's a park on the border of Chinatown was actually part of, one, of Chinatown at one point. Acknowledging somebody who was prejudiced against respecting or honoring him was actually seen as disrespectful to the community. And so with the work of the advisory group that we're part of and discussions among City Hall, they've now renamed that park to be Harmony Park to acknowledge and to just try to promote the concept of inclusivity. So to include also concepts or thoughts of the indigenous people who had settlements or would, would house there during some of the seasons as well. Okay, thank you very much.